בשם אבא, ועברה, ועורכת קודשה. תשבוקת על ההלכה במרמה, ועל הרעה שלמה, וסברה טבה לבני נשא. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. This presentation is titled, Islamic Theological Terminology and its Relationship to Orthodox Christian Triadology. We will be looking at how the Muslim doctrine of attributes as ontological real and distinct entities has its roots in the Orthodox Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Islam, from its inception up to the present day, never taught a developed theological doctrine that was unified. Historically, there was basically the Qur'an and various personalities that people followed. The various different theological positions almost always revolved around these personalities. The distinct grouping of, say, Mu'tazila, or Shia, or Ash'ari, or Maturidi, or Athari, as codified bodies or schools of thought did not come until later. So, for example, the proto-Sunnis did not subscribe to quote-unquote Ash'ari theology, Maturidi theology, Athari theology, or any particular theology. In the early days of Islam, any theological notions would more or less be folkish in the sense that what people believed beyond the simple literal reading of the Qur'an was not the result of systematic exposition. When the early Muslims following the Qur'an would say, for example, that Allah is Ar-Rahman, the Most Merciful, they would simply understand this to mean that Allah will forgive them their sins and spare them from hellfire. Apart from that, there was no developed doctrine what to be Ar-Rahman actually meant in either an ontological or epistemological sense. Likewise, any other predication of Allah, like Al-Alim, All-Knowing, Al-Qadr, All-Powerful, Al-Murid, All-Willing, Al-Khalik, the Creator, and so on. To the early Muslims, any predication made of Allah was simply a means of indicating Allah's interaction with creation and was not regarded as likening Allah to creation. In this regard, the language of the Qur'an was seen as nothing more than language with which mankind could relate. Hadith, which would eventually come to play a prominent role in jurisprudence, or fiqh, were wholly irrelevant for the development and exposition of Islamic theology or kalam for the Ash'aris and Maturidis. There were two main reasons for this. One, hadith content for them simply did not concern itself with theology, being more of a practical nature. And two, the starting point of the kalam was historically based on the principle of rationality or intellect, in Arabic, aql. Hadith as a source for the development of kalam is a significant point of departure between Sunni and Shia methodologies, for Shia hadith readily reference matters directly related to kalamic exposition. Now, the focus here is not to go into the minutiae of what was exposited by every single Muslim theologian or mutakalim. For our purposes, the two prominent schools of thought that eventually solidified, namely the Mu'tazil al-Shia on the one hand and the Ash'ari Maturidi on the other hand, are sufficient. Therefore, for brevity, when I make reference to the Sunnis, I mean specifically the Ash'aris and Maturidis. And when I make reference to proto-Sunnis, I mean those Sunnis who would eventually come to embody the Ash'ari and Maturidi doctrines. We will not concern ourselves with the Athari school of thought, represented by the so-called Salafis, Wahhabis, and Ibn Taymiyyans, since the use of Aql is not to be found among them. The Kalam originated with the Mu'atazila, which began within a hundred years of the establishment of Islam long before the times of Ash'ari and Maturidi. The Mu'atazila held the position that Aql alone could be used in deducing theological truths. So prominent is Aql in their worldview that there is a tradition tracing back to the 5th and 6th Shia Imams stating that Aql was the first of Allah's creation. As recorded by Al-Kulani and his Al-Kafi, إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَزْوَاجُ الْخَلَقَ الْعَقْلِ وَهُوَ أَوَّلْ خَلْقَ مِنَ الرُحَانَيِينَ Verily, Allah created intellect, rationality, and it is the first creation among the spiritual beings. Whereas the Mu'atazila were concerned with regards to the use of aql as a theological nuance, the Shia would look to the guiding aql par excellence of an imam as a path towards Allah. It is the imam's aql in understanding the Qur'an in order to guide believers in correct jurisprudence, belief, and devotion. In this way, the imam, and not the Qur'an, is the divine guide and also why the Shia are more of a monolithic entity compared to the Sunnis. This sentiment is readily found up to the present day among the Shia. For example, with regards to their first Imam Ali. Sadaw Yamal Ali Ali 
بدون این علی علی خدا خدا نداشتم My voice Ali Ali without this Ali Ali God God I would not have meaning that if I were not able to call out to Ali then I would not have God the reciter in this example, Sayyid Majid Bani Fatime, has recited events attended by the Grand Ayatollah Khamenei of Iran. So the sentiments of the recitation are representative of true Shia beliefs and are examples of why Sunnis do not hesitate to pronounce takfir or disbelief on the Shia. For those who are interested to delve deeper into the Shia, there is an excellent scholarly treatment by Professor of Islam, Muhammad Ali Amir Moazi in his book, The Divine Guide in Early Shiaism. The non-Mu'tazila approach, namely what eventually developed into the Sunni position of the Ash'aris and Maturidis, is a stark contrast in comparison. For the non-Mu'tazila, the use of aql was applied specifically to existing philosophy and theology in an attempt to shoehorn those paradigms into a Quranic framework, as we'll demonstrate shortly, relying partially on the scholarly work of Professor Harry Wolfson in his book, the philosophy of the Kalam. The use of Aql by the Sunnis was an attempt to make this new Islamicized philosophical theological paradigm rationally coherent. Now we will examine some terminology that was used by the Mutakalimun. The Arabic term that best reflects the shades of meaning, of nature, essence, substance, the Arabic category of Tabi'a or Jawhar Shay, is Sifa or plural Sifat. Sifa has the overtone of description or describing. Another term that was used in close association with Sifa is Ma'ana, which means meaning, sense, signification, denotation, connotation, concept, notion, and in a more broader context, nature. At the time of the Mutakalimun, this term was interchangeable with Sifa as well as Shay which literally meant thing, which it still means today. Both ma'ana and shay were used to translate the Greek term pragma, i.e. thing, especially with regards to Aristotle. For example, see Ishaq ibn Hunayn. In order to emphasize the realities of the persons of the Holy Trinity, the Greek fathers used the Greek term pragma as synonymous with hypostasis and prosopon. It was used at the Council of Antioch, as well as by St. Athanasius, by St. Basil, by St. Cyril of Alexandria, and even Theodore Abukura in the 8th and 9th centuries. When writing of the Holy Trinity, Yahya ibn Adi, a Christian, Sadia, a Jew, and Ibn Hazm, a Muslim, all use the terms Shay and Ma'ana. Furthermore, Yahya ibn Adi also writes that the Akanim, or persons, of the Holy Trinity are khwas and sifat, where khwas is equivalent to the Greek idiotites of St. John of Damascus's hypostatike idiotites, or hypostatic properties, and where sifat is equivalent to the Greek of St. John of Damascus's to charakteristikon tis ideas hypostasios, or that which is characteristic of the proper hypostasis. A sha'ari refers to attributes using the term ma'ana in his luma, while using the term shay in his majalis. He even writes in his baqalat that the mutakalim Abdallah ibn Kulab uses the terms shay, ma'ana, and sifa interchangeably. Therefore, we have a direct connection linking the Orthodox Christian Greek pragma, prosopon, and hypostasis as real entities of the Godhead to the Muslim Arabic sifa, ma'ana, and Shay as real entities of the attributes of Allah. With regards to person or persona, there are two Arabic terms, that and uknum. The word that has the overtones of self, being, essence, nature, and is readily used in that sense by the mutakalimun. That and sifa do overlap in meaning, but they are not wholly synonymous with each other. On the other hand, the term uknum is an Arabicized term that derives from Syriac. Usage of uknum is always, and I stress always, with respect to the original Syriac meaning 
namely the Christian notion of hypostasis. So when Yahya ibn Adi uses the Arabic terms shay and ma'ana, as mentioned previously, in place of uknum, he does so with the full meaning of the term uknum. Without being pedantic of all the inflectional forms, uknum, or its Syriac form knum or knuma, has the following shades of meaning. Category 1, hypostasis, substance, actual existence. Category 2, person, individual, the individual self. And category 3, the persons of the Godhead. So for example, the Nestorian heresy is recorded in Syriac as Trin Kyanin, two natures, Watrin Knumin, and two hypostases, Itauhi Mashiha is Christ, Dav Parsupa Davruta, and the person of the Son, at Hayad, united. Or stated slightly differently, Christ is two natures, Kyanin, and two hypostases, Knumin, united in the person, Prosopon, of the Son. Again, that's the Nestorian heresy recorded in Syriac centuries before the advent of Islam. As is well attested, the Nestorian hypostasis, Knum, was a real hypostasis. Therefore, any contact that Islam would have had with Nestorian heretics would most definitely have resulted in understanding the term Knum to represent a real existence. Other inflectional forms of Knum convey in substance, in person, personally, actually existent, personal, proper, own, real, substantive, personality, subsisting, existent, personal. Here is a link where you can see all the verses in the New Testament in Syriac that contain the root Qaf, Nun, Mim. After each verse, you will see the link Analyze. If you click on that, you will then see that verse in English and every Syriac word broken down into its base meaning and grammatical usage. There is one verse in particular, though, that I will talk about to illustrate the point. It is John 6, 53. In English translation, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This last part, you have no life in you, in Syriac is, Laita lachun haye baknubkun. Laita, there is not, lachun, to you, haye, life. That alone would translate to, to you there is not life. To then say, in you, would simply be, bachun. But that's not what is written. The Syriac continues, bachnum kun, instead of bachnum. The English has the simple meaning, in you. But bachnum kun has a lot more suggestive overtones. In yourself, in your existence, in your reality, in your substance, in your person. The usage of Knum is stressing the reality of the body and blood of Christ, the reality of the Eucharist. Communion with Christ gives the person actual life, actual existence, for through it our hypostasis unites with the Son, a real divine hypostasis. So now let's reread John 6.53, but let's do so in conjunction with John 1.3-4. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself, you have no life in your existence, you have no life in your reality, you have no life in your substance, you have no life in your person. For all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made, and in him is life. The point I'm stressing here is the absolute unambiguous reality of the term Knum. For the Sunnis, the Sifat are eternal self-standing in Allah's Dat, Uzaliyatu Qaimatu Badatahu Ta'ala. Remember, that is the native Arabic equivalent of the Syriac Knum. In other words, the Sifat are eternal self-standing in Allah's Self, in Allah's Being, in Allah's Essence. In this way, they have a reality not unlike Knum. There is remarkable similarity in the usage of the Muslim Dat and Sifa with the Christian Uknum. In Syriac, 
The term kiana has the meaning of nature or essence in the Orthodox Christian sense of usia. So, for example, the Orthodox statement is had knuma wa train kiane, or one hypostasis and two natures with respect to Christ. The term diophysite is train kiane. Consubstantial is shwe kiana. Of the same nature or essence is bar kiana, which is used for the Greek homoousios as in the Nicene Creed. Eventually, kiana would be supplanted by the Greek usia, as in the Syriac would spell out the word usia phonetically in Syriac as a foreign word and use it for the exact same meaning of kiana. Therefore, by the advent of Islam, the distinction between knum and kiana was well established so that there was no confusing the two terms. They were distinct in usage and understanding. All parties understood that uknum denoted a real existence. If this were not the case, then the proto-Sunnis would simply be mu'atazila. Moreover, the Sunnis distinguished the attributes of Allah from the essence of Allah, just as how there is a distinction between knum and kiana. So we see that, in fact, the mutakalimun were indeed aware to some degree of some kind of essence hypostasis distinction. To this effect, the historian Mujan Momin writes in his book on Shia Islam with respect to Tawheed or divine unity, and I quote, In the dispute between the Mu'tazili and Ash'ari theological positions that concerned Islam a great deal in its early days, Shias took the Mu'tazili viewpoint. One consequence of this is that they hold the names and attributes of God to have no independent or hypostatic existence apart from the being and essence of God. Any suggestion of these names and attributes being conceived of as separate is thought to entail polytheism. In other words, the Mu'tazila were absolute divine simplicitists. While they equated eternity with divinity, so to be eternal is to be divine, for them distinctions implied division so that the akanim of the Trinity divide God's essence. Therefore, the Mu'tazila considered the akanim of Christianity as polytheism, and by extension, the attributes of Allah when considered as real eternal entities alongside the essence of Allah. There are non-Muslim witnesses, such as Abul Faraj, also known as Bar Hebraeus, as well as Jews like David al muqammas Sadia, Joseph al-Basir, and Maimonides, who compare the reality of divine attributes to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Abul Faraj explicitly writes that the Mu'tazila quote-unquote, avoided the akhanim of the Christians. And Maimonides writes that the Jews followed the Mu'tazila theological position. Now, the Christian fathers wrote of the hypostatic differences, namely the ungeneratedness of the Father, the generatedness of the Son from the Father, and the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father through the Son. The Mutakalimun knew very well about these hypostatic differences, but they also listed other distinctions. This is a very important point. Where exactly these other distinctions came from is not certain. It is quite possible that these additional distinctions are the result of predication of certain qualities to the various persons of the Holy Trinity as narrated in the New Testament text, as we'll see shortly. Another likely possibility is some sort of Neoplatonic triadic system. Despite that the Mutakalimun were in contact with the Greek branch of Christianity, there did exist in the Latin branch of Christianity Neoplatonic forms for the Holy Trinity, as demonstrated by the likes of Marius Victorinus and John Scotus Aragena. However, it is unlikely that Muslims were aware of the Neoplatonism of Latin Christianity. Instead, it is more likely that they appropriated Neoplatonism directly from the likes of Iamblichus, Theodoria of Asina, and Proclus, since their systems bear remarkable resemblance to the Neoplatonism of these philosophers. The triads of these philosophers consist of variations on 1. Essence, or usia, or the existent toon, or subsistence, iparxis, or existence, toine, 2. Life, or zoe, or power, dynamis, and 3. Intellect, nous, or intelligence, tonoin. There is one triad I would like to single out, and that is goodness, Agathotis, power, thinamis, 
and knowledge, gnosis. I'll come back to this in a moment. In the triadic system known to Muslims, the father was distinguished by existence, essence, or generosity. The son was distinguished by life or wisdom, or the equivalent knowledge or reason. And the Holy Spirit was distinguished by wisdom or knowledge or life or power. So for example, Yahya ibn Adi writes that the father is generosity, Jud, the son is wisdom, Hikma, and that the Holy Spirit is power, Qudra. This triad corresponds exactly to the Neoplatonic triad just mentioned, Agathotis, Thinamis, and Gnosis. Sadia's list is essence, that for the father, life, haya for the son, and knowledge, aum for the Holy Spirit. Kirkasani's list is substance, jauhar, living, high, and knowing, alim. Eliya of Nisibis's list is essence, that, or self-existent, qa'im bin nafsihi, life, haya, and wisdom, hikma. Al-Muqamis equates the Son, or Logos, with wisdom, Hukma, and the Holy Spirit with life, Haim, and so on with others. But there is now another Neoplatonic list I would like to specifically single out, and that is Shahrastani's. Existence, Wujud, Life, Haya, and Knowledge, Erl. The reason why this particular list is important is because in Shahrastani we see a direct outline of what would eventually become the Sunni doctrine of contingency of the attributes. The Muslim Al-Maidani writes in his commentary to Aqidah Tahawiyah, Hai, ayma suf bi sifatu al-haya, wa hiya sifat uzaliyatu qaymatu bidatahu ta'ala, la tata'alak bishai, wa hiya shartu aqali la sa'ir as-sifat kama an al-wujud shartu laha. Hai, it is namely described by the attribute of life, al-hayat, and is an eternal self-standing attribute of His, Allah Most High. It is not related to anything. It is a rational precondition for the remaining attributes, just as existence, wujud, is the precondition for it. Remember, Shah Rastani, who is a well-respected Ashari, equates the father with wujud, or existence, and the son with haya, or life. Now just as how the father is the rational precondition for the son in Christianity, the Muslim attribute of wujud is the rational precondition for the attribute of life. And just as how the Gospel of John teaches that all things were made through him, i.e. the Logos or the Son, and without him nothing was made that was made, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, so too do we see that the remaining attributes of Allah are dependent on the attribute of life. Just so that we do not misunderstand what Al-Maidani is writing with regards to contingency, Consider what the following two respected modern-day Islamic authorities say. Him being alive, that's actually very important because that is necessary for all of the other attributes. Because if there's no life, then the other attributes can't exist as well. So the life is the most essential attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Life is the most essential attribute of Allah. When we say al-hayatu, the attribute of divine life, this attribute is not connected to anything, but it validates for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have these divine attributes because if he did not have the divine attribute of al-hayat divine life then he could not be murid he willing he could not be qadir all powerful he could not be al-alim all knowing it validates for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be described with these divine attributes so we see there's an obvious direct one-to-one -one parallel, if not outright transference, of a Christian-like doctrine in the Islamic reality of attributes. This next part is extremely important. It is recorded by Shah Rastani and Ash'ari that the denial of real attributes by the Mu'tazila always singled out a twofold or threefold combination consisting of life, wisdom, knowledge, or power. The reason being that not all attributable predicates to Allah in the Qur'an were initially deemed as real ontological entities by the proto-Sunnis. So the Mu'tazila restricted their attacks on the reality of attributes as an attack strictly on the Christian Aqanim or Neoplatonic triads. 
Shahristani records that the proto-Sunnis did not consider other attributes as ontologically real, so they were not the subject of attacks by the Mu'tazila. The Sunni Kalam took its own course in history and continued to develop independently, but fundamentally, the reality of the divine attributes of Allah are based on the Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity. The Ash'aris would eventually come to expand their list of, and I stress, real attributes to get to today's list of 20. Category 1, a single personal attribute, existence or wujud. Category 2, negating attributes, beginninglessness, endlessness, oneness, self-subsistence, absolute dissimilarity. Category 3, abstract or affirmative attributes, life, knowledge, will, power, hearing, sight, speech. This third category is also negating, but the attributes are independent compared to the second category. Then there is an entitive category, which is just the active participles of the third category. The Maturidis continue and have a category of active attributes or taqween, i.e. create, sustain, etc. Essentially, what the Ash'aris and Maturidis ended up doing is expanding the three persons of the Holy Trinity in Christianity to 20 persons of Allah in Islam. Now, Ash'aris and Maturidis might say, well, we don't actually believe that. Well, it doesn't actually matter if as an Ash'ari or Maturidi one believes it or not. The fact remains, Ash'ari and Maturidi Kalam has its roots in Christianity and this is proven to be historically true. Just because as an Ash'ari or Maturidi the word Sifa is used instead of Uqnum does not mean that now all of a sudden the doctrine of attributes is completely dissociated from the Christian doctrine of hypostasis. To sum up, the early Mutakalimun understood that Orthodox Christianity clearly distinguished essence from hypostasis and that each hypostasis or uknum of the Trinity has a real and distinct ontological existence. Mu'tazila Muslims, Jews, and Christians all considered the proto-Sunni doctrine of real attributes to be directly related to the Orthodox Christian Trinitarian doctrine of hypostasis. The development of the proto-Sunni doctrine of real attributes can be traced to the predications made of each of the hypostases of the Holy Trinity in the New Testament, as well as Neoplatonic triads. The contingency of attributes of the Ash'aris and Maturidis directly parallels hypostatic relations in the Holy Trinity. Ash'ari and Maturidi Muslims essentially believe in a bastardized Trinitarian Neoplatonic hybrid with regards to their conception of Allah's attributes. Shlama amkulhun aylain devam shikha nun amin. Peace be with you all who are in Christ. Amen. Foxy, honestly.